King Louis XVIII had neither Napoleon's charm or charisma. France had a constitutional monarchy now, but with royalists threatening to abolish the gains of the revolution and the economy floundering, the king soon became unpopular. For 10 months, Napoleon watched and waited. Then on February 26, 1815, he slipped off of Elba with a handful of soldiers and eluded British and French warships. After making a mistake or suffering a misfortune, he said, the man of genius always gets back on his feet. Once ashore, only the king's army would stand between Napoleon and Paris. Six days after landing in France, he confronted a regiment of infantry ordered to bar his way. Napoleon advanced alone to meet them. Soldiers, he cried, if there is one among you who wants to kill his general, his emperor, here I am. Suddenly the soldiers began cheering wildly. Long live the emperor, long live the emperor. Two weeks later, Napoleon was in the French capital and Louis XVIII had fled. The news hit Europe like a bombshell. The devil, his enemies said, has been unchained. And again, the mystique of Napoleon. Here's the emperor, vive l'empereur. They shouted all the way to Paris. But it was really sort of crazy. He hadn't got a hope. For months after Napoleon's abdication, the Allies had been at odds with one another as they met in Vienna to hammer out an agreement to determine the shape of post-war Europe. Now, Great Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia united once again. They declared Napoleon an outlaw, an enemy and a disturber of the tranquility of the world, and readied their armies for war. All of Europe was against him. There wasn't a chance of France beating this coalition arrayed against it. By the end of May, the British and Prussians had two armies in Belgium. Austrian and Russian soldiers were on the way. Napoleon's only hope for survival was one last desperate gamble. He planned to drive a wedge between the British and the Prussians and defeat them before the Austrians and the Russians could arrive. Napoleon raised an army and marched toward Waterloo. Napoleon's fate would be decided on a field of rye and clover, one mile long and three miles wide. Waiting for him was Great Britain's most formidable soldier, the Duke of Wellington. Tall, aristocratic, rather arrogant, disdainful, not an enormous amount of imagination, but totally unflinching, nerves of steel. He knew his army, and he knew how, what they would take, and he knew how to deploy them, and he was superlative on the defensive. Wellington commanded 68,000 men, but he was counting on 72,000 more. The Prussians, led by Marshal Blücher von Ballstadt. Blücher's greatest wish was to capture Napoleon and have him shot. With Blücher and the Prussians by his side, Wellington would outnumber Napoleon two to one. The Duke impatiently waited for the Prussians to arrive. Wellington said to Blucher, the love of God, come as fast as you can. Go we'll fight the last moment of the last man. But Blucher was still many miles from the battlefield, and Napoleon had sent a sizable force of his own to intercept him. It was not clear whether Blucher would get there on time or at all. The night before the battle, soldiers on both sides caught what sleep they could under a heavy downpour. The next morning, Sunday, June 18th, 
They were sopping wet. So was the field in which they were to fight, now dotted with puddles and caked in mud. As the sun rose higher in the sky, the Duke and his soldiers braced themselves. But Waterloo remained silent. Nearly five hours had passed since daybreak, yet Napoleon had not given the order to attack. He said he was waiting for the ground to dry so he could maneuver his cannon. I felt that fortune was abandoning me, Napoleon said. I no longer had the feeling that I was sure to succeed. Finally, at 11.30, Napoleon's artillery opened fire. His battle plan was simple. Wellington's men occupied the outlying farm buildings on both flanks and the crest of a ridge in the center. To break them, Napoleon ordered no elaborate maneuvers. He would stake everything on a massive frontal attack. He meant to attack Wellington first, and the quicker the better. He thought Wellington would run for his ships. Then he would turn around and blast Blücher. Shortly after midday, Napoleon ordered a barrage of his most powerful cannon. 74 guns steadily lobbing cannonballs at Wellington Center. But Wellington had ordered his soldiers to take cover behind the crest of the ridge on which they stood, beyond the reach of the French guns. Napoleon's motto was never attack a man in a prepared position. But here he has no choice. He's got to get Wellington out. Napoleon's soldiers charged. The British counterattacked, driving the French back in confusion. The French cavalry was destroyed, but the English center appeared on the verge of collapse. The sun hung low in the sky, glowing blood red through the trees and smoke. It was then that Napoleon saw them, Prussian soldiers emerging from the smoke, still in the far distance. He called for the Imperial Guard, the most feared of all his soldiers. Throughout the fighting, he had held them in reserve. Now, he sent them forward. They were just 40 paces away when the Duke gave the order to fire. In less than a minute, 400 Frenchmen fell. Still, the guard came on. They were absolutely magnificent and came very close. He nearly broke through the British line. But it was too late. The first time in the whole history of the Napoleonic Wars, the guard was seen to falter and then eventually fall back, shouting, sauve qui peur, everybody, every man for himself. And then the word ran through the army, la garde recule, the guard is, is retreating. Wellington snapped shut his telescope, took off his hat, and waved it. No cheering, my lads, he said. Forward and complete your victory. As the guard fell back, panic spread through the ranks of Napoleon's army. And then disaster was upon them. The Prussians were in the field. The Prussians really was the last drop of water that, that tipped the bucket over. The Napoleon had to draw forces from his center to uh, deal with Blucher. Blucher won the battle. If, it, if Blucher hadn't been there, I don't think Wellington would, would, have, uh, would have made it. A damn nice thing, Wellington said later. The nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. 